Hello, and welcome to a Sunny Book Nook. My name is Sunny, and today we're gonna get through <laughs> these books that I read in the last couple months, last few months of 2023 very quickly. I'm losing light, I'm losing time. <laughs> I just, I, I need to get through these already, okay? Basically, my camera battery died when I was trying to film this video initially, and I also didn't talk about the nonfiction reads the first time around, so we're gonna get through some of those today right now. I'm gonna try to give myself like a minute to talk about each of these books. Let's see how successful that is. The lipstick I'm wearing today is the Fenty Beauty Poutsicle in the shade Zesty Bestie 02. If it gets on my teeth, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so a book that I read back in back in September that I didn't talk about in my wrap up before this was Running from Bondage, Enslaved Women and the Remarkable Fight for Freedom in Revolutionary America by Karen Cook Bell. This book is a nonfiction account that compiles and analyzes a lot of different pieces of enslaved black women's history during the revolutionary American period, as you can, you know, surmise from the title. But there's a lot of analysis of the runaway slave ads that were put, the fugitive ads that were put in newspapers, and a really focus on the pre-Civil War, pre abolitionist movement sort of work that was done by these enslaved women and the work of running away, how that is an active abolitionist agency itself, how these different communities were formed, like different maroons that's talked about in one of these chapters. I tabbed a bunch of this because I thought there was a lot of things that were really interesting. Relationships to the British that America had at this time due to the revolutionary period and the different like slave rebellions and things that were happening in like the seven, late 1700s, which is a period of history that gets overlooked a lot when it comes to enslaved people and particularly enslaved women and how they would free themselves and the different initiatives and failures and attempts that they made. So this follows the lives of many different people and looks at the legal and social structures surrounding them in a very detailed way because Karen Cook Bell is a historian. So this is pretty good. I think if this interests you, this is something that you should read, essentially. Another historical nonfiction book that I read back in September was Only the Clothes on Her Back. Clothing and the Hidden History of Power in the, in the 19th Century United States by Laura F. Edwards. This book I also tabbed the fuck up because it was so interesting in terms of how textiles and clothing was a way for women to own property and how it was a form of sort of feminist agency ownership and financial freedom in a world that did not allow women much freedom in, in any regard during the 1800s. We look at working class women's lives and the lives of all types of women, including enslaved women and more upper class women and the ways that clothes, textiles, fabrics, legal ownership of it, the social mores surrounding it, the way that it was sort of a liquid asset for a lot of people, the ownership of like trunks and how that being a source of like property and stealing and what that looked like for courts that were more informal than courts that were for like slave owners, property owners, and for richer people and what it looked like in a world where in the 19th century America, a household would have like 10 people living in it at any given time in just a single room. So how could you discern what was personally your property and not? Especially when it has to do with like textiles, which were a really important part of American life and finances during this time. So it was like a social indicator, of course, a class indicator and a way for people to like in the industry itself and the way that women who worked in the home were able to make money from it was like there's so many ways that this book as a piece of like legal history legal scholarship in analyzing this history was really fascinating and i think if you have any interest in like american fashion or the history of textiles and finance and law in america this book focusing on 19th century women's 
sort of ways of existing in the world was really was really interesting okay now getting back to the fiction and the other stuff so the video cut off when i was talking about the dead take the a train but this book actually did end up in my favorites of the year video part two so if you haven't watched that already you should go watch that where i talk about this book more in depth but the book that i read after that in the month of october was death valley by melissa broder this book I think is the weakest of Melissa Broder's fiction because I've read The Pisces and I've read Milk Fed and I think those are both better than Death Valley because Death Valley is a more meta narrative sort of examination of Melissa Broder's experience with family and grief and going to like the desert you know to try to escape from her life but also to write in her sort of existence as a writer i mean i don't really think i don't know if it was well thought out enough but it's still like well written and it's still interesting and like snappy and funny but darker and more meta than her other work so i rated it like a three 3.5 it was it was less enjoyable, I think, than her other stuff because I think it was just less fictional. I think I like her fiction the most. Then I read a memoir called Inverse Cowgirl by Alicia Roth Weagle. Weagle. This book I rated three stars. It is about a woman who is intersex and who has worked in sort of activist spaces and democratic campaign organizing and stuff like that for her adult life and it follows her from childhood all the way to her like college life and then her adult life after that she talks a lot about traveling to brazil and the friends and the partnerships and the relationships that she's had during her life as she's come into understanding herself as an intersex person and intersex activism and how that's really important to like queer rights and existing in a highly gendered society and navigating sort of the medical world and get seeking proper treatment be coming to terms and coming out as intersex and what that looked like when she was a little girl and an adolescent and older and also surviving sexual assault and rape and just existing as a woman in in the world as well especially in the specific sort of circles that she runs in and yeah i mean i thought this was pretty solid i don't know if the writing was anything too special and I, yeah, I think it was, I think it was fine. It, it was a very good, interesting look at her intersex experience. And for that, I think it was very valuable. Then I read a nonfiction book called Necropolis, Disease, Power, and Capitalism in the Cotton Kingdom by Catherine Oliverius. This book does a lot of focus on New Orleans, I think, but of course, all throughout the Cotton Kingdom, like the South in the 19th century around and how yellow fever was a drive for what she describes as immunocapitalism, I think. The way that these social structures were reinforced through this pandemic that, I mean, uh, we're familiar with that, aren't we? The ways that the deaths of working class people and the deaths of different races of people were utilized to justify either labor exploitation or racism that was reified within the medical establishment, how people subverted that, how the structures of slavery were ultimately deeply embedded with yellow fever as something that was a fundamental element of the social fabric of society at this time and how the cotton industry and the cotton kingdom as she says was intertwined with yellow fever all of the labor and the non-slave labor that was involved in this industry so it was very interesting it was super compelling written in a very straightforward and compelling way while still getting into the nitty-gritty of so many different experiences and minds and perspectives and ideologies of various individuals and medical professionals and political leaders and industry leaders as well as the ordinary lives of individuals who are affected by yellow fever and how people were dying en masse and how the social apparatuses at hand and the powers that be really took advantage of that 
for their own gain. And this was a very, very interesting read. And then I read another nonfiction book that was a collection of essays called It Came From the Closet, edited by Joe Valise. And I rated this book like three stars because I didn't think that a lot of these essays in here necessarily spoke to me, but I understand how it's valuable and what it contributes and the analysis that is needed and present in it, which is examining how horror and the horror slasher genre in film is intertwined with and shapes queer experiences and coming of age in that way and the different takes and relationships that different queer people have had with different movies and within under this genre so i don't know i thought it was fine i don't think anything in it was particularly memorable i suppose but nothing here stood out as particularly like bad although i mean there are just some essays that i was like i don't know if what you're saying is meaningful to me or necessarily even correct in the analysis or your conclusions on like a political level but you know that's not even my business this is your writing so whatever and my takeaway is that i thought it was like fine whatever whatever so <laughs> yeah and then the next book that i read was human sacrifices by maria fernanda Ampuero. and this book i rated four stars this is a short story collection that was scary scary horrifying horrifying it was horror and it really took it to the next level i think the first short story in this book Oh, it got me. I mean, I think we're following this woman who basically gets kidnapped almost nearly because she gets this job offer that she can't refuse and it's in the middle of nowhere she gets there and this guy is acting weird as fuck and she just has to survive that night. We see that happen. We see what goes on and the rest of the book just follows a bunch of different scenarios of Latin American women or people in Latin America or different circumstances that really focus on people just trying to survive under horrific circumstances and the terror surrounding that. There is certainly just horrifying elements and certainly the literary part, the literary fiction undergirding of this text is like so there because the writing is so on point in my opinion. I think that this short story collection was pretty memorable, although there's, I mean, I feel like there were only a handful that I, that I can now remember, but I'm sure if I like looked back at the different stories, I would be like, oh, and that one was really good. And that one was really good. But I think this was translated from Spanish, but don't quote me on that. So excellent, stunning, has these really abrupt endings that I was like, whoa, that's, that's, this is the end. Okay, I guess we're on to the next one. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. I rated it four stars. Um, it's definitely not a favorite of the year because again, like I didn't remember every story. And I think that sometimes the endings were like a little bit too abrupt. And I, sometimes it was like, I want, I want more. So yeah, I should check out this author more actually. And then in October, I read Black Wave by Michelle T, which ended up in my favorites of the year video, part one. So you should watch that. I talk about it there extensively. I think what I really enjoyed about this, and this is my first Michelle T book I read, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this is the book that got me into Michelle T. And I think like it was so butch femme. It was so focused on art making and writing. And it was so grounded in queer punk culture of like the 90s and sort of the transience of life and the ways that it was expressed through the writing as well as the humor of it. I was obsessed. I was obsessed. Loved this book so much. And then I read a 4.5 star novel that I really enjoyed. I completely devoured this book and that was Bedrock Faith by Eric Charles May. This book is basically like a neighborhood gossip story. I think this is set like right outside of Chicago or something in this kind of snobby neighborhood or people think of it as snobby, I guess, but it's just sort of like a somewhat like just well-established middle-class African-American neighborhood in the Chicago suburbs kind of, I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly. But what's really the focus of this book is this guy who comes back home to this community he like gets out of prison or something gets back home and the whole neighborhood is shaken up by his presence and he basically as 
a young boy and as a teenager had kind of terrorized like a lot of the people in the neighborhood by like I don't know killing their cats or just doing doing shit around the neighborhood that was just not cool and people do not like him because of that so when he gets back home and he stays with his mom who's been very quiet and kept to herself ever since he left he now ha has come back with a religious fervor that is insane really out of prison and trying to make everyone around him in this neighborhood live to a godly manner in a complete opposite and yet same way that he terrorized people by being a delinquent in his youth in terms of kind of destroying the fabric of this neighborhood in a lot of ways like we see the ripple effect of him moving into back into his mother's house who's next door neighbors with this woman whom we're in the perspective of a lot of the time and she is a well-respected figure in the neighborhood she's a more elderly woman she has grandkids goes to church and the neighborhood meetings regularly and we see all the different families as they react to him being back in the neighborhood and all the crazy shit that goes down every chapter i was gagged like i was like what the hell is happening um and then i would see this ripple effect of violence that begets violence or drama that begets more drama or just all these little things that I was like ugh and that is exactly how a small tight-knit community and neighborhood works one where no one minds their goddamn business and everyone is looking at their windows mailman is reporting on everyone's business it's it's pretty crazy like I had such a good time with this book but it was also very very dark at times kind of tragic at others and I think like the author really got to the psychology of these characters and paints a picture of each of them in a way that is like they very much fit an archetype of what a particular figure in a neighborhood is like while still being these complex people who have complicated dynamics with each other so certainly a read that was enjoyable and that I would 100% recommend and I don't think enough people have read this or are talking about it all right and the next book that I read was Nightwood by Juna Barnes this book was um is very interesting okay like I think that the way that Barnes was able to articulate like lesbian yearning through the modernist form is just really it's really incredible and we follow all these different perspectives that it sometimes got confusing but there is this guy who is kind of faking being a count but he's not really and he's hiding kind of the fact that he's jewish and then there's this guy who is like this irish doctor and then there's this woman who has had this like grand romance with someone with this woman but it's kind of in the past and there's also there's other she has a daughter whom she's afraid is having an affair with this other woman like it's very dramatic but in this very under in, in a in a subtle way i guess but also juna barnes was incredibly and you can see it throughout the text like she was definitely like a racist and an anti-semite i mean i don't know it's hard to avoid with these modernist writers but i just think that they're so like the doctor goes on these huge rants all the time. These characters, like, are constantly beefing with each other in, like, a very silent way. I think here on page 63, where she's talking about Robin. Robin, as a character, is a woman that all these characters, well, a lot of these characters are really obsessed with. She is the wife of the count the fake count and she is the object of desire for the woman main character type figure i mean a kind of no one and everyone is the main character in this i would say but here it's basically like yet sometimes going in about the house and passing each other they would fall into an agonized embrace looking into each other's face their two heads in their four hands so strained together that the space that divided them seemed to be thrusting them apart sometimes in these moments of insurmountable grief robin would make some movement use a peculiar turn of phrase not habitual to her innocent of the betrayal by which nora was informed that robin had come from a world to which she would return to keep her in robin there was this tragic longing to be kept knowing herself astray nora knew now that there is no way but death in death robin would belong to her like it's just this shit that's like oh my god like y'all yeah, you people are obsessed with each other or at least Nora's obsessed with Robin and like it's it's everyone's problem now like But the writing is beautiful as as you can see. It's it's a classic for a reason. I don't know what to tell you. All right, and now 
we get to a read in November, which ended up on my favorites of the year list in my first video, which was A Memoir of My Infertility, Knocking Myself Up by Michelle T. Once again, she appears. And this book, again, hilarious, touching, real, queer. T's writing just has this lightness to it that I don't know I've that I found anywhere else, I guess. I don't know. It was it was great and I talked about it in my favorites video so just just watch that you know I mean I, again the title is sort of self-explanatory it's this queer woman who's trying to get pregnant it's not really working <laughs> and we see her journey with that we see her journey with her relationships her friendships all these beautiful amazing wonderful queer people in her life and <laughs> Also, the ways that she navigates the grief and the joys of like trying to become a mother, what like family means to her. The next book that I read was a play and that was The Children's Hour by Lillian Hellman. I loved this. This was gripping and I want to be in a production of this play one day. Like this was so moving. Wow. It's kind of melodramatic. I don't know if I'm using that term right. This play conveys the experience of being accused of being gay by kids who don't know what the fuck they're saying but it's a very serious allegation because it's like the early 1900s i think this was written in like the 30s or the 40s no it was the 30s maybe and like you know, McCarthyism, etc. This play is about these two teachers who run this girls' school, and it is kind of, it's like a boarding school for girls, and these two women, I think it's Martha and, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the other woman, but there's a film, which is a famous film based off of it, starring Audrey Hepburn and, I'm forgetting the name of the one who plays Martha. Anyways, the the play though that it's based off of is very, very moving and excellent because it is about, it's not about queerness, but it is. And it's not about lesbian identity, but it is. It's about being accused of being and the implications and the consequences of that in the environment of this board, all girls boarding school and these two women who are just trying to build this thing that they've worked on. They're like college best friends. They have, they have built this whole thing together and it's gone crumbling down because of an accusation. But yeah, anyway, it was a really good play. And I really liked it. I have another nonfiction book on here, but I left my copy back in Boston, so I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> uh, back to another Michelle T book, Valencia. This book was wild and crazy, and it really gets into the nitty gritty of like that punk scene of the queer SF world. That like where we follow this girl who is traumatized from her Massachusetts upbringing real massachusetts is a terrible place and she gets to the city and she's like finding all these new things getting involved in the weird sex stuff that is happening and the <laughs> like just all the subcultural communities and gay people that she runs into and runs with in these circles and the alcoholism that she gets into that she's in denial of and the drug use that happens like it's pretty crazy we we just see the wildness of her life this main character um valencia great book against memoir complaints confessions and criticisms this book i rated five stars oh my god the reason why i didn't put it on my favorites of the year at least is because i was like i'm already putting two michelle t books on here i think putting a third one on might be a might be some overkill i don't know but this this book well this book is a collection of essays and there's an essay on here about camp trans surrounding the michigan michigan's women festival throughout the 2000s that michelle t went to and then eventually was kicked out of and was involved in camp trans and her experiences there it talks about her experience as a writer and doing um sister spit which was this group that she helped start and she ran which they just like got in a van and tripped toward the country doing slam poetry and these women and these queer people reading their writing to to audiences and it talks about the personal and the feminist and the political and the queer and 
the just so many things i think it was so excellent and every essay was like whoa the insight is through the roof i don't know why that weird noise that just happened was like the bathroom toilet or something so ignore that but yeah against memoir excellent and it, she writes about writing a lot and she writes about obviously you know she writes about her own life a lot and her experience she, she talks about the way that like the bacterial infection involved like through intravenous drug usage that ravaged the queer community in the 90s in San Francisco tore up and tore through the people that she loved and knew and the way that other people did not give a fuck and that was heartbreaking she talks about heartbreak she talks about did she talk about mother and motherhood in here i don't even remember but this book was excellent and again funny sharp incredibly smart as michelle t's writing always is all right and then i read the price of salt by patricia highsmith this book is what the movie carol was based on and the book yeah like it's better than the movie i mean i don't know <laughs> i i guess i don't i don't have strong opinions either way i gave this like three stars because I, I just I don't know if I'm a mommy issues like in terms of you know wanting a older woman in my life type of dyke whereas this like 19 or something year old girl who's working at a department store counter selling dolls runs into this blonde woman obviously named Carol becomes the center of her life around Christmas time and we see the way that Carol with her own small child daughter and her husband whom she's divorcing but he doesn't in this book he doesn't really want to divorce her all the relationships that happen here it's a lot of dialogue a lot of trying to escape the persecution the McCarthyite homophobic hunting down of gay people that people fucking experienced women experienced these women experienced here and it's harrowing but it's also very ordinary in the way that it's presented this love is extraordinary but the circumstances are are ordinary yet again extraordinary in in, in the queerness of it i think like the way that Carol just like pulls up in her car and is like, Therese, like get in, like, come on, let's, let's go here. It, it was interesting, I guess, you know? I mean, it's such a classic and I'm glad I got to it, but eh, eh is kind of how I feel. Okay, now we have a, another nonfiction book I read at the end of November that was Embattled Freedom Journeys Through the Civil War Slave Refugee Camps by Amy Merle Taylor. This book was excellent this book is about the civil wars union outposts and the way that enslaved people would run away from their plantations and go to these union military outposts to like not be slaves after the emancipation proclamation and like before it as well um i mean i think we get a lot of exploration of that and that historical reality and the way that people were treated by union troops the policies surrounding enslaved people as refugees at these military camps the towns and settlements and communities that were built around these union encampments these military establishments in their you know in the way that they were invading the south and fighting the confederates framing these places these spaces as refugee camps itself is pretty i think extraordinary and important and i think all these different ways like we're looking at like fort monroe in 1864 in the way that these two men who worked for the union army are trying to work for the food distribution process for the black people who had uh, previously been slaves up until the Civil War, who were refugees in the Union encampments, how, you know, they would go around and assess who, who would need what rations. Like, we get that type of thing. We see the ways that women and uh, rape and sexual violence was 
present in these encampments and also we get these like photos of the the encampments and the barracks and the communities the settlements that were built in for the refugee housing and how like the union soldiers and the union army basically saw the enslaved people who are running to these camps en masse as like refugees and how to build these support networks and housing for them like it was a reality of the war that i think people don't really consider when talking about the civil war like you know the the imagined experience of like people were still slaves during the civil war i mean true and then there's the emancipation proclamation everyone was free not true and <laughs> then like everything was fine like well no the union army and its presence and the way that the spatial reality of interactions between enslaved people people who had run away from slavery and the union army in its military outpost as it was you know in the south trying to defeat the confederacy those really all shaped the different lives of enslaved people throughout the south and we see the movement that was happening during this time so very very important and under under examined history that is brought to the light i think and a framework of history that is important in understanding the civil war which isn't just a series of battles it's people's fucking lives and communities that become totally destroyed after the the union just leaves and like now where do all these a lot of people who set up entire communities and stores and houses on this land you know what happens now the economy their economies was based on these soldiers being here so yeah very interesting i love history american history i love it well i don't love it in the sense of like the things that happen but you know to study anyways the next book that i read in the month of november was poor things by alistair gray alistair gray i don't know i read poor things obviously because the movie came out by Yorgos Lanthanamos and I'm gonna go see it today actually so that's that's cool but everyone loves the fucking movie and I knew I was gonna love it because Yorgos Lanthanamos made the favorite and the favorite is a fantastic movie and poor things as a book was incredible I rated it five stars it well 4.5 stars so it would be a favorite of the year except I think it kind of dragged a little in perhaps the middle-ish or towards the beginning like in the first third i was like what the hell this is so you're pissing me off but then as things progressed i was like this is so entertaining and funny like because this book is a satire you know it's following this woman well no it's not following a woman <laughs> it's basically the, the the framing device of the story is i'm hello my name is and i am writing this book and everything that happens in this book is 100 percent true and he's talking about how, like, as a medical student, he is, he's working to become a medical doctor. It's like Victorian England or whatever the fuck. And his, one of the mentors, one of the people who's been totally ostracized in the world of medicine in London or something at this time, he shows him, our main character, like, something really incredible. And then one day shows him another incredible thing, which is the fact that apparently he brought back this woman from life by um saving her from the thames uh when she jumped in or whatever and giving her the brain of a baby so we see <laughs> we see that it's very like it's a female frankenstein type story i guess i think that's how it's been described before but everything that plays out it's crazy it's very crazy and it's very interesting the way that this woman learns more about the world the way that she gets involved with our main character but that kind of gets diverged sort of after the first week <laughs> she travels all over she learns things about the world from different people and their various perspectives about how the world is and why it is that way and it is very interesting the very end of this book oh it was a gag it was a gag i'm just gonna i'm gonna say it like i did not see it coming but when it did hit i was like well of course well of course so i'm interested to see how the movie does it if it does do that and um, yes, it's absurdist, of course. I mean, I, am I using that word right? I don't even know. But it's crazy. Let me just say that. <laughs> to be honest, I've already been talking for so long. <laughs> I might have to do my December wrap-up in another fucking video. I'm so sorry. But I did 
talk about my October and November reads except for that one book that I don't have. I don't have, oh my wrist keeps cracking. I don't have the book, the copy of with me, so oops. But I'm running out of light. This is gonna be the end of the video. And I hope you enjoyed my, my attempt at a wrap up of the books I read in 2023. And we're gonna see you in my December wrap up, I guess, soon, which has a lot of interesting books on it. So I hope you do go watch that video when, when it comes out. But that's all I have for you today. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and comment down below if you've read any of these books and any of your thoughts on them, if you know you haven't already, because I love to know what you think if you have read any of these, or if any of these books sound interesting to you, or if any of these books remind you of books that you think I would like based off of my thoughts on these. So yeah, anyways, that is finally all I have for you today, and I will see you in my next video, hopefully. Okay. Bye.